astronomy. Please welcome Dr. Dwayne Hamaker. Put that away. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Awesome. All right, how many people here love astronomy? Put your hands up. Woo! Yeah, more enthusiasm. How many people in here really love astronomy? Woo! Okay, now how many people are absolutely crazy about astronomy? Oh, <laughs> kind of plateau it off and double down. No, seriously, who loves astronomy? Put your hands up. Woo! Awesome. Awesome. Um, astronomy is, I think, what's considered one of the oldest sciences, and it's something that I've been passionate about since I was a little kid. Um, what I would like to do is talk to you a bit about how indigenous people have understood the night sky. So before I do that, I would like to recognize that we are on Aboriginal lands, and I would like to recognize the traditional owners and the elders and custodians of the um, Aboriginal communities in this region the Kunai Nation in particular. Um, there's the Wobberong, there's a few different Aboriginal groups in this area. So what I'd like to do is talk to you about something relating to National Science Week. National Science Week is all about science. And what I would like you to gather from this talk by the time that I'm finished is that Aboriginal people did practice science. We're going to go into some detail about that regarding the night sky. Um, has anybody noticed a teensy bit of an accent? Yeah. Maybe? Where do you guys think I'm from? Uh, Canada. Canada? No, not Canada. America. American all the way. All American. Um, I'm from the state of Missouri, which um, prior to about a week and a half ago, nobody had any idea where Missouri was. Now everybody does, although maybe not for the best reasons, because um, of Ferguson. But um, I loved astronomy since I was about your guys' size, about, about five or six years old. And I grew up in sort of a small country area in mid-Missouri, surrounded by cows. Uh, but we had nice clear skies. And I just grew up fascinated by that subject. I was one of those super nerdy kids all the way through school. And I went on and studied physics in high school. But I was also fascinated by this place on the other side of the planet. Crazy looking animals, crazy looking you know, landscape. It's an amazing place called Australia. Uh, at the time, I knew everything I knew about Australia I got from Crocodile Dundee. So you get some, some idea of what I knew about it. But um, I came down about 11 years ago for the first time and just fell in love with the place. I moved back a couple years later, went off to the University of New South Wales where I did astrophysics. Uh, I enjoyed that. I, I was spending time under telescopes looking for planets around other stars. But this, this stuff about culture and astronomy was just a bit too much of too much of an interest to me. I, I found that fascinating. So I decided to do a master's degree in that and do a PhD in indigenous studies where I spent a few years looking at how Aboriginal people understood the night sky. And I've been here about eight and a half years and I absolutely love it. I, I think I'm going to stay permanently. It's been a fascinating subject for me and I'd like to, um, you know, sort of extend some of that passion to you because I'm not sure how much you know about indigenous cultures and aboriginal cultures. Here's a map that sort of highlights some of the diversity of aboriginal cultures in Australia. There's no one single aboriginal language or aboriginal story about the Pleiades or aboriginal word for the moon. There are hundreds. Each of these little blobs, colored blobs you see on here, that's a different major language group in Australia. When I mean different, I mean different. Different language, different culture, different traditions. Just look at that for a minute and let that soak in about how many different. There are about 400 major language groups in Australia, and each one of these language groups is broken up into smaller clans and dialects. Aboriginal people have been here for tens of thousands of years. And over tens of thousands of years, they've observed nature, they've tried things out. Aboriginal people have developed complex and detailed knowledge systems about the natural world through experimentation, through observation. They have explanations for all these different facts, which is like scientific theory. And they used nature for predictive purposes. They could plan things in ahead. That is what we call astronomy. That's what we call science. It might not be exactly the same as Western science, but that doesn't matter. It's still a form of science. We find that cultures all around the world 
practice their own form of science. So what I'm going to talk about is astronomical science. So what sorts of things, when I say indigenous astronomy or aboriginal astronomy, what does that really mean? That means structured knowledge about the sky, about the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, and how people use that for practical purposes like navigation, for calendars, for ceremony, for law, for totems, for kinship systems. It goes on and on. I could give you thousands of examples, but I'm not going to do that today. I'm just going to give you a handful. And a little bit later in the talk, I'm going to focus on the Melbourne region here. So you can see Melbourne kind of comes this one spot where, where several different major language groups come. The Kulin Nation comes together. You have Wurundjeri, Bunurong, Watharong, all in the Melbourne region. So I'm going to give you a couple of stories from these different areas here in Victoria. Now, astronomy is a significant component of not only Aboriginal culture, but also colonial Australian history as well. So we all know that Captain Cook came to Australia. What was he doing just before he came to Australia? So before Captain Cook came here, what was he doing? Yep. He was trying to make a map of the world? No, not exactly. Something very special and it relates to astronomy. That's right. He was charting the transit of Venus. So because all the planets are in the same plane, sometimes Mercury and Venus, they're closer to the sun than we are, they'll seem to move directly between us and the sun. It'll look like they're moving across the sun. We call that a transit. And if you measure the transit from somewhere in the northern hemisphere and somewhere in the southern hemisphere, you can use basic mathematics to figure out how far away the Earth is from the sun. That's interesting. But that's why he came to Australia. When the first fleet came in 1788, Lieutenant William Dawes was the first astronomer on the ship. He's also the first person to befriend a local Aboriginal woman named Patagarang. This young woman taught him the local Derig language and traditions. And he recorded those in journals, which you can actually see online now. They're freely available online. Some of his journals were lost, but we do see from some of them that he actually wrote down names of the Milky Way, of the Magellanic clouds, of the stars, of the sun and the moon in different times of the day. So we have Aboriginal astronomy from first colonization in 1788. And that's been a major part of Australian history. Uh, there's this real big famous city in, in, in Queensland um, that's named after a guy named Sir Thomas Brisbane. You've all heard of Brisbane, right? He was an astronomer. So when you go back and you look at the history of Australia, astronomy is found all throughout it. So it's both from the colonial perspective and, of course, for tens of thousands of years from the Aboriginal perspective. And if we look at the three national flags of Australia, we'll find astronomical symbolism in each one. So I think everybody's seen this flag. This is the flag. This is the Aboriginal flag developed by Harold Thomas. He was a Luritja man from the Central Desert. So what does the color red in the flag mean? Everybody should know this. What does it mean? It's the land. The red signifies the ochre in the Central Desert and the people's connection to the land. What's the black? Not the sky. It's the people. It's the black skin. It's the people themselves. What about that big yellow thing in the center? The sun, right. The giver of life. Now, we've got to remember, when we say indigenous Australia, there are two main different types of indigenous communities. There are aboriginal people, which are across the mainland of Australia and Tasmania, but up on that little strip of water between the tip of Cape York Peninsula and Papua New Guinea is the Torres Strait. The Torres Strait Islanders are a Melanesian people. This is their flag. What do you guys think the green, this is, this is made by Bird and Namek. What do you think the green means in the Torres Strait Islander flag? The land, the islands themselves, right. What about the blue? Ah, water, the ocean. What about the black? Same. It's the people. The people who live between the land and the sea. This, um, this strange white looking thing. Does anybody know what that's called? Anybody want to guess? Do you know? No? Nope. It's called a jerry or a headdress. The warriors used to wear these. They're, they're used, ceremonial, used for ceremony now, but before the warriors used to wear these things. And what is that thing right in the center there? Star. Now, there are two things the star represents. How many points does the star have? 
five representing the five major island groups of the Torres Strait. And the star itself represents a navigational star because navigation was so important to the Torres Strait Islander people. Now you might notice the color is white. Does anybody happen to know what the color white means? Clouds. Sorry? Clouds. No. Do you know? Peace. peace, exactly right. It means peace. Um, it also signifies what the islanders call the coming of the light. Anybody want to get, you guys are being quizzed to death on, I know you love this. Like you're back in school again, right? Does anybody know what the coming of the light might refer to? Do you know? No? Nope. It means the coming of the missionaries. That's what it refers to. Now, well, into this flag, which I'm sure everybody has seen at least a couple of times, right? What's this famous group of stars right here called? Everybody should be yelling this out at the top of their lungs. Southern Cross, that's right. Um, in astronomy, it's called Crux. It's one of the 88 official constellations. The biggest constellation of those 88 is the water snake, Hydra. Anybody want to guess what the smallest one is? It's the Southern Cross. It's the smallest of all 88 constellations. Now, the Southern Cross is also prominent in some other national flags. You see it in the Kiwi flag. You see it in the Papua New Guinean flag. You see it um, in the Brazilian flag. The Southern Cross is the most famous constellation in the Southern Hemisphere. And not only is it significant to European Australians, but it's also significant to Aboriginal Australians. So with many Aboriginal groups, it represented different things. It might represent a stingray being chased by two sharks, which are the two pointer stars. Um, in Western Victoria, the top star, which is kind of red, and these other stars, which are blue, represent a little possum who was chased up to the top of a tree. It was actually a man who was chased up by Chingal, the emu. And for his cowardice, he was turned into a possum. And that's why the top star is kind of a reddish color. So you see lots of different views of the Southern Cross throughout the world. Well, actually, sorry, throughout the Southern Hemisphere, because you can't really see this up in the Northern Hemisphere. The first time I ever saw this is when I came down to Australia, and I thought, well, that's a peculiar looking constellation. And then I realized it was the same one on the Australian flag. I had no idea before that. It was really amazing. What I'd like to start off with is telling you a little bit about some indigenous constellations. Now, most Aboriginal groups didn't use a connect the dots pattern to constellations like the Greeks and Romans did. So we saw the Southern Cross. Usually, not always, but usually individual stars or groups of stars, like a star cluster, represented characters in a story. So like I said, sometimes like the Southern Cross you saw might be a stingray or it might be a tree. In other Aboriginal cultures, it's two brothers near their campfires, and each one of the stars represented a campfire or their brother. But if we go to the Torres Strait, we can see some of these Connect the Dots constellations. Now, I've been spending a bit of time in the Torres Strait, because um, I've actually got a big three-year project looking at islander astronomy. And what fascinates me about the Torres Strait is their entire culture is completely based on astronomy. Yet the last time anything about their astronomy was published that was comprehensive was in 1907, over 100 years ago. There's a great book called The Stars of Tagai by Nani Sharp, and it's all about islander culture. It relates somewhat to the stars, but it doesn't really tell us a lot about their astronomy. But their culture is based on the constellation of Tagai, or the story of Tagai. In islander culture, Tagai was a great fierce warrior. He was also an expert fisherman. He had a crew of 12 men that he called the Zugabuls. One day, long ago, he took the Zugabuls on a fishing expedition out in the reefs. They had no luck, no luck catching any fish, so he left the boat, went out onto the reef to try to find an area where they could get some fish. The 12 men stayed behind. They grew tired, they grew impatient, and they drank all of their reserves of water. And as time grew on and they got hotter and hotter, they decided, not too brightly obviously, to drink Tagai's water. When Tagai came back, he found that all of his water had been drank and he was furious. And in his fury, he killed all 12 men. He grouped them up into two groups of six, tied them up, cast them into the sea, where they were later taken up to the sky, where we can see them as two groups of stars. Usium, the Pleiades, and Utumal, the stars in Orion's belt. 
Tagai himself went to the opposite side of the sky, and he's an enormous constellation. He's standing like this on a canoe. His left hand is the Southern Cross holding a spear. His right hand is the constellation Corvus, the crow, holding a fruit. And he's standing on top of his canoe, which is represented by the big curve of stars and Scorpius, the big scorpion. He put himself on the opposite side of the Zugables to be away from them, because he's still angry with them. Now, for those of you who know your Greek and Roman astronomy, this might remind you of the story of Orion and the scorpion, who got into a battle with each other, and the gods put them on opposite sides of the sky to keep them away. So tonight, we go outside, and you have a look through the telescope, so you'll see Scorpius straight above. That's Tagai which means the, the Zugables, Usia Minuti Molar, straight down below us. You won't see them until summertime. So this is actually a, a different constellation. This is the constellation of Baidum, the shark. And I've had some really amazing experiences with Baidum myself. So in Islander culture, Baidum was represented by this group of stars. Now I'm not sure if many of you are going to recognize this group of stars, but I certainly did. This is the most famous group of stars for we Americans in the Northern Hemisphere. It's sort of like your equivalent of the Southern Cross. Does anybody know what that is? Big Dipper. That's the Big Dipper, right. That's part of the constellation Ursa Major, or the Big Bear. So that's our version of the Southern Cross. That's our famous constellation. Now, the first time I saw it, I was a bit perplexed because I thought, oh, that looks really familiar, but what's, what's going on? I'm like, oh, there it is. So it's upside down for me being that you see it from the Southern Hemisphere. But down here in Melbourne, you'll be lucky to see that star, and it just barely come above the horizon. You won't see any of these other stars. You have to go up to the top end to be able to see these stars. Can anybody see a shark shape out of these stars? Yes. If you look closely, so here's the tail coming back, here's the dorsal fin, and up here's the front of the shark. This is a pretty big constellation. This constellation told the Islander people a few different things. First off, when it was horizontal on the horizon like this, just after sunset, that means the coming wet season, the kooky season, um, was going to approach soon and they needed to begin planting their crops. So the Islander people did a lot of fishing and did a lot of agriculture. They planted a lot of crops in their gardens. Something else is very interesting. After sunset, when the shark moves down in the sky and his nose touches the horizon, that means the shark breeding season has begun. So here's a great artwork showing that. So here's the, the shark bitum. Now I asked the islander elders, does bitum refer to a specific shark or is it just a generic term for a shark? And they said, no, it's just a generic term. But there are lots of sharks. You see hammerheads, reef sharks, everything. So this was quite amazing because when I was up in the Torres Strait a couple of months ago, I was out the night before we were going to fly to Murray Island. So we were on Thursday Island, which is in the lower part of the Torres Strait. And uh, my boss, Professor Martin Nakata, who is an islander and one of the top indigenous educators in the country, uh, we were standing outside after sunset looking up at the stars. And I said, hey, look, that's, that's biting the shark. And it's sort of the nose is touching the horizon. Doesn't that mean the shark breeding season has begun? He's like, yes, it does. So we went to Murray Island the next day, dropped our gear off in the guest house, and went down to the water. So the people tell us, the traditions tell us that when the shark breeding season is coming, you don't want to get in the water because it's very dangerous. And I was quite amazed to have experienced this. I'll show you a little two minute video. This is ankle deep water. Now it kind of does no justice to show you that video because it doesn't really capture the magnitude of how many sharks were in that water that was this deep. And there's a reason they're cresting over tops because the sharks are only about that thick from dorsal fin to bottom and they were just all over the water. They were going crazy, which was a bit disappointing for me because it was really hot and I was dying to get in the water for a swim. 
And uh, they said, you know, I said, you know, do, do people swim on the beaches? And they said, oh, yeah, they swim. I said, what about the sharks? It's like, ah, oh, we train the sharks to only bite white people. <laughs> so, no, it was, it was a real blast, but it was a great opportunity to see up close these traditions in action. What I'd like to do now is talk to you about a different kind of constellation. So we think of constellations, we think of bright stars, we connect the dots that make a familiar pattern. But there are lots of constellations that are not made up of the bright stars in the sky, but made up by the dark spaces, particularly those in the Milky Way. So we look here, we can see the Milky Way quite clearly. So Professor Glazebrook showed you images before. Here's the middle of the galaxy right here. You can't see very well, but right along here is Scorpius. And right here is the Southern Cross and the two pointer stars. Now, there are lots of aboriginal stories about the Milky Way. In southeast Australia, it's usually a waterway, Warrnambool, or some variation of Warrnambool. So if you've heard of the town Warrnambool on the west coast, out towards Portland, that means river waterway. It also means Milky Way. And you see all these dark spaces in the Milky Way. So as Professor Glazebrook talked about before, these are areas of cool gas and dust. It's sort of like fog obscuring the background stars. But curiously, there are lots of indigenous constellations made up of these dark patches in the sky. So the coal sack right here in Waterman traditions is a dark cave, and inside lives an evil spirit. And if you break sacred law, he'll cast down a fiery star from the sky that will come down and kill everybody. So it's a warning to obey laws and traditions. In other cultures, you might see uh, the rainbow serpent. You might see crocodiles. You can see a whole number of things. But there's one famous shape made in this constellation that you find all across Australia. Does anybody see a particular animal right here? Profile? Yep, he's got it. An emu. The emu in the sky is really famous. You find that New South Wales and Victoria, all the way out to Western Australia, all the way up north, down south, you find it everywhere where you find an emu. It's really magnificent to see that. So if you look here, just by the Southern Cross, you see the head of the emu, and the beak is right in front of it. You see its neck come down, and its body looks a bit like that. So what does the emu tell us? It's not just a pretty picture in the sky. There's some practical use, usually something about seasons or food, and usually something about law and ceremony. And we find with the emu that we have both. Now, the exact shape of the emu varies from Aboriginal group to Aboriginal group. It's not exactly the same everywhere, but it's pretty close. So, in Western Victoria, it's called Chingal, for example. So, what I'd like to do now is play you a little two-minute video from a Gamilaroi man from North Central New South Wales talking about how his, his mob, his people, see the emu in the sky. And I think, yep, I'll just pull it up real fast. And hopefully it's not too loud. I'd just like to talk about um, some traditional knowledge that was handed down to most of us indigenous fellows in this area. And it's um, the emu in the sky. Around April, May, every year, the emu will appear in the Milky Way. Just underneath the Southern Cross, you'll see a dark spot, a rounded dark spot. That's the head of the emu. In front of him, of course, is his beak. And as we follow it down, you can see his neck in the dark spots of the Milky Way. Comes right down to his body. And you can see his legs. And you can see a couple of eggs underneath. At that certain time of year, it's the time that, for us to go out and collect emu eggs. We go out, of course, into the bush, always leaving some eggs for next year and for the generations to keep going. 
They only last up until early June. Any time after early June, they start getting chicks in them. But before that, from April, May, you're pretty right to go gather. So from that we can see that the rising of the emu just after sunset, when the sun goes down you see the Milky Way, the emu rising above, that tells the Aboriginal people that the emu eggs were coming into season and they could collect them. Now a colleague of mine, um, Robert Fuller and, and Ray Norris, have been working with elders in the Gamilaroi country and as it turns out the emu story is very complex, it's very detailed, it's not just that one little bit. Now there's something curious, I don't know if anybody noticed it, when he referred to the emu, did he say he or she? What do you guys think, were you paying attention? He. Said he. Why would, why would he be referring to a male emu with the eggs? Do you know? That's right, well that doesn't lay the eggs, but he sits on top of the eggs, he incubates the eggs, and he cares for the young. So, this is also symbolic of male elders bringing the boys into manhood, which brings us to the next component of it, which is that of the ceremony. And I won't go into too much detail because some of this knowledge is considered secret or men's business, but I'll give you the, the real basic details, which is the public knowledge. In many Aboriginal cultures across Southeast Australia, well across all of Australia, you had male initiation ceremonies. So when young men in their early to mid-teens were going to become men, they were taught the laws, the traditions, the customs, the songs, and they had to recount all of this and go through a ceremony process. Um, the term we use is called a Bora ceremony. This is actually from the Gamilaroi people as well. And what you usually had at a Bora ceremony were two big circles. One larger circle made of raised earth, like you see here. And a pathway that connected to a smaller circle some distance away, and that's where the secret part of the ceremony happened. So this part was considered the public part, where the boys went through the main aspects of the initiation, and then the secret business happened somewhere else. Um, there are some boar rings even near Melbourne, up in Sunbury. There are some earthen boar rings there. Now what's interesting about the boar ceremony is that it relates to the emu in the sky. These male ceremonies in many parts of, particularly southeastern Queensland and New South Wales, were timed to the time of the year where the emu wasn't coming up, but he was about to set on the horizon. He was straight up and down. And you find that if you look at the orientation of the big circle to the little circle, they're oriented with the earthen bora, the bora on the ground. See, in Aboriginal cultures, everything that happens on the land is reflected in the sky. They're not two separate things, they're connected. And this is a chance where the ground connects with the Milky Way. And you see the sky bora and the ground bora at the same time. So they're connected to the emu in the sky because the male emus help rear the young, just like the men bring the boys into manhood. So I'd like to, to give a couple of quick stories from Victoria, and, and specifically one from Rundry people, which is up near this area. Now, we know more about Aboriginal astronomy in Victoria than we do anywhere else in the country which might seem strange, I don't know, but a lot of the early colonists worked with a lot of the Aboriginal elders and they wrote down almost everything they saw. So what we know about stuff in Victoria is quite in depth and it goes back quite a long ways. Uh, William Stanbridge was an Englishman who wrote down a lot of the astronomy of the Borong people. It's a clan of the Rogaya language group up near Lake Tyrrell, up in the northwest of, of uh, Victoria. And he only wrote down four pages, but those four pages were a gold mine of information about how Aboriginal people use the stars. So for example, the star Vega in the constellation Lyra is related to the Malifold. These little chicken-sized birds, they're flightless, they build these big mounds in which they put their eggs. So they don't sit on their eggs, they put the eggs in the mound with some rotting uh, organic material 
And as that stuff rots, it gives off heat. And they put sand on top. And the beaks of these birds are very sensitive to heat. And they can actually gauge whether they need to take some sand off if it's getting too hot, or put some sand on if it's getting too cold. But they relate to the star Vega. When Vega rises just after sunset, that means they're building their mounds. When Vega's high in the sky after sunset, that means that they're laying their eggs in the mounds. And when Vega sets at sunset, that means that the eggs can be collected. Start, they start hatching the chicks. So you find dozens of examples of this. So that's one aspect about how Aboriginal people use stars for food economics, for, for seasonal calendars. Um, but there's a different story from the Wurundjeri that I found quite interesting. Uh, in New South Wales and southeastern Qu uh, Queensland, there's a figure called Biami. He's the sky all father. In Victoria, that same figure is called Bunjil. He lives in the sky. Bunjil is quite often associated with the star, um, oh, I just forgot it, Fumalhult. Weird name for a star, huh? And a star called Altair. But in this story, there's a very special place from Victoria, right here in eastern Melbourne, up near Lilydale, where there was this deep cavern, sort of a bottomless pit. And the Aboriginal story was that the people on the land broke sacred law, did things that displeased Bunjil. And in anger, Bunjil cast down a fiery star from the sky that came to the ground, killed everybody, and formed this deep cavern. This cavern is called Bukatabili. Yes, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. It's a place of deep spiritual significance to the Aboriginal people. There's only one unfortunate problem with this. That's the site now. It's completely carved out by a giant quarry. Now right here is a campus of Swinburne University in Lilydale. And as I was coming down, um, flying in from Eden, where I gave another talk a few days ago, I was looking at the plane and I saw this giant hole and I could tell from you know, high in the sky how deep this thing was. I thought, wow, that's really, that's a big hole. And then it dawned on me, that is this site. This is the quarry in Lilydale. It was exactly the same one. So this site of, of spiritual significance, unfortunately, has been completely destroyed. It doesn't seem that it was actually a place where a meteorite came down and hit the ground. But it, it was very, you know, it was meant to be symbolic. But uh, a, a Kiwi sculptor, developed a sculpture that's uh, right here on the Swinburne campus where they use a rock from the quarry as a reminder of the story of the local Wurundjeri people. Now this is something that actually quite interested me. You find lots of stories from all across Australia about fiery objects falling out of the sky, hitting the ground, forming holes, death, fire, destruction. But we don't know of any meteorite craters in the whole eastern part of Australia. This is one of my favorite indigenous stories. This is the story of Norala. It's told by Auntie Mavis Malbanka. Her husband died several years ago and she became the custodian of this story. She is a senior custodian of the Western Aranda people. So the story, the place she's talking about here is about 140 kilometers west of Alice Springs. And the story goes as this. There, in the dream time, there were a group of eight women who took the form of stars who were dancing a corroboree, a ceremony, in the Milky Way. One of the women was carrying a baby. So she put the baby in a, a kulaman or a turna, this wooden basket, and set the baby down in the Milky Way to go off and dance the corroboree with the other women. As the baby began to squirm a little bit, as you can imagine, the turner was not very stable. He fell off the Milky Way and came crashing to the ground. So I'd like to play quickly a little video showing the story of Norala as told by Auntie Mavis herself. <laughs> Right. 
So when the baby fell to the earth, the turna, the kulman, fell on top of him and drove all the rocks around him upward. The baby's parents, the morning and the evening star, continue to search for their baby to this day. You can still see the turna in the Milky Way, or in the sky, falling out of the Milky Way as a curve of stars called Corona Australis, the southern crown. And if you look at it, the curve of stars looks just like a Kuleman or a Turner from the very front. You'll be able to see that tonight when you look outside because the Milky Way is directly above us. Now, it's very peculiar. When the baby fell down, he drove all the rocks upward. Well, what do we have at the site called Norla? We have this, a gigantic meteorite crater. This ring-shaped mountain range, which the Europeans named Goss's Bluff, which is Norla, is about five kilometers wide and 150 meters high. It's the central part of the bigger crater itself, which is 22 kilometers wide. So imagine how big of a rock had to fall out of space to create an impact crater 22 kilometers wide. It's enormous, and it's old. It's 142 million years old. Very old impact crater. So what I love about this story is it relates to the sky, it relates to the land, it's a connection between them. And the story mirrors the Western scientific explanation perfectly. It's couched in different language, but so what? It still explains how that giant crater formed. Now we know that no humans were alive 142 million years ago, so how did the, the Aryan people make this connection? Well, they simply could have inferred it, for one. Two, it's also possible that more recent meteorite impacts have happened that people would have seen. Well, are there any examples of that in the area? And the answer is yes. Has anybody by chance, maybe some of the astronomers here ever heard of Henbury? Maybe a couple people? So Henbury is about 120 kilometers south of Alice Springs along the Bacon Mountain Range. It's where a big chunk of iron from space came careening into the atmosphere, the pressure broke it up into a bunch of fragments, and it impacted the ground, creating about a dozen meteorite craters over an area of about a square kilometer. 
This impacted about four and a half thousand years ago. So considering Aboriginal people have been here for tens of thousands of years, a few thousand years ago is nothing. Can you imagine what that experience would have been like? To see this giant fireball, brighter than the sun, coming out of the sky, hitting the ground, setting it on fire, blowing debris into the atmosphere, making this reverberating sound that would have been heard for miles and miles around. If you were close enough to see it firsthand, you probably got toasted. But if you were far enough away, it would have been this amazing sight that crashed on the horizon, set everything ablaze. So the question is, are there any oral traditions that describe this event from four and a half thousand years ago? And the answer is yes. Back in the early 1900s, some geologists had heard about these craters from some of the early um, well, explorers, squatters, whatever you'd like to call them, who went out and, and made it, you know, took these, took these big plots of land up, and they heard about these big holes in the ground. They didn't quite know what they were. So some of the explorers, some of the, the, the white guys, white fellows, took some of the elder Aboriginal men with them to go out as guys. And the elder Aboriginal men said, you know, when they came close to it, they said, we're not going to go any further. And when, when asked why, they said, well, this is where the fire devil, which came from the sun, ran to the earth, set the ground ablaze, and created those big holes, and it killed everybody. And, you know, they also said that they don't collect, so in some of the craters, after it rains, which is rare in the desert, but some of the craters actually retain water. And some of the elder, elder men said that they don't go and collect water because they're afraid the fire devil will drop iron on them again. So there are these traditions that are four and a half thousand years old that are a living memory of that impact. So we find examples of that in other parts of Australia, such as Wolf Creek. So it's really amazing to see these stories. The last thing I'd like to talk to you about tonight is a bit of Aboriginal astronomy very close to Melbourne. So when we think of archaeoastronomy or cultural astronomy, people tend to think of these big stone arrangements in, in Europe, mostly Britain. They think of Stonehenge. And they ask, do we have any equivalents of that here? Well, the answer actually is yes, we do. There are lots of stone arrangements all across Australia, and they were used for different reasons. Some of them were ceremonial. This is a place called Wordy Ewan. It's about halfway between Melbourne and Geelong. It's very close to the Little River. It is about 50 meters from end to end and has about 100 stones made of basalt. And they range in size from about this big to almost waist height. There are three prominent stones up at the tip here. And if you stand down here, there are two lines of stones that go here and here. And you see those two in the center. Also, if you stand here, there's a little row of stones up here that go out, and one here, and one there. So this orients exactly east-west. So, you know, 20 odd years ago, a researcher named John Morrison, who did a master's degree researching the Borong astronomy that was written down by William Stanbridge, he went out and investigated the site, and he thought that it related to the sun, the setting position of the sun at different times of the year. And if you stood at the stones and you looked out, you'd see a little row of stones there that marked the equinox. You'd see a couple of trigger stones at either side that represented the winter and the summer solstice. About eight or nine years ago, uh, Professor Ray Norris, who was my PhD advisor, went out and did a survey and found that if you stand here and look down the straight lines of this stone arrangement, it marks the setting position of the sun at the solstices and the equinox in the center, just like those little ones out there did. And it looks a little bit like that. Now, it's quite an amazing stone arrangement. It actually slopes downhill going this way a little bit, which if you'll notice a bit of a gap right here, it's not that there were no stones there. Some of those stones have actually rolled down the hill. Now, there's farming that goes all the way around the stone arrangement, up until about maybe as far as near to that table. So a few meters away, they're actually farmland. But this site is protected, and it's owned and managed by a Watharong corporation. The problem is that because colonization was so sudden, we don't have a lot of knowledge about what the stone arrangement meant. We don't know exactly what it was used for. 
It's probably something ceremonial, but there's this old joke in archaeology says, if you don't know what it is, say it's ceremonial. So we don't know exactly what it means. We do know that the family that owns this big chunk of land has been the same family all the way since first settlement. And they say it's always been there. And there are other Aboriginal stone arrangements around Victoria and New South Wales that are similar. We don't know how old it is. It could be a few hundred years old. It could be a few thousand years old. It could be 10th. We have no idea how old it is. And trying to date it has been rather difficult. But it is still, to this day, an important site, an important place for spirituality for Aboriginal people. So we're continuing to do some work with the elders and the corporations to try to unlock some more of the secrets about this site. Um, just up where the curtains are here would be where the Little River is. And we knew that there were these giant trees along the Little River. And it's possible the area was heavily wooded. So would you have been able to see the sun positions if the trees were in the way? Well, maybe. Maybe it's really old. We don't know. But it truly is an amazing site. And our research has found more sites like this across Australia. So it's exciting new stuff that we're doing, exciting new research. Um, one of the curious things, though, is it's commonly called an Aboriginal Stonehenge. But if it proves to be older than British Stonehenge, maybe we should be calling Stonehenge a British word of Ewing. We don't know. It's quite interesting. So if anybody happens to have, oh, Sorry, there's one more slide that, that sort of shows what it looks like when you're standing here and looking up at the other side. That's the sun setting at the so winter solstice, the equinoxes, and the summer solstice. So a really amazing place. Now, if you'd like to learn more, if anybody has their phones and the QR code reader, this will take you to our webpage at the University of New South Wales at Nurragilly. Um, cut a little bit off the top there. But that'll take you to our webpage. You can, we've got a blog at aboriginalastronomy.blogspot.com.au or just Google Aboriginal Astronomy blog. It'll take you to that. We put up the latest research we're doing, um, work with elders and communities. We talk about events that are coming up. We put educational materials up. You can find all of that on our blog. You can also follow us at Aboriginal Astronomy Project on Facebook. And if you tweet, we are at Aboriginal Astro. Thank you. Oh, yeah, that's right. The ball of careening objects. I'm sure OHS would love this. Eh? First question No brave souls? Got one over here. Um, I don't need a ball. <laughs> sure. Um, There are lots of stories about fiery objects falling out of the sky, you know, setting the land on fire, blowing rocks, you know, kilometers away, uh, sounds of, of deafening, reverberating noise, you know, terrifying everybody, killing people, setting the grass on fire. But in many of these stories, when we go look where the story, where the people said the story took place, we don't see any meteorites or impact craters. It could be that sometimes stories are taken from one place to the other. So during the stolen generations, when Aboriginal people were taken from their communities and brought to the missions or the, the areas, they brought the stories with them. And the initial story might have been this mountain, this river, these things were part of the story. When they came to the new place, they assigned the story to those geographical land, landmarks as well. It could be that some of those stories are actually talking about things like the Henbury impact and have traveled further away. So we don't know, but it's some great, great research. We're putting, putting out new stuff all the time. Uh, the, the guy right behind you is jumping up and down. You want a ball? All right, ready? Good catch. <laughs> Baseball arm there. It looks just like an emu, doesn't it? It looks just like an emu, and it just happens to be that the emu rises in the sky when they're laying their eggs. So the Aboriginal people noted this, and they built a system around that. That's what we call science. Now, what you might find interesting is that shape in the sky is not only found in Australia. If you go to South America, 
The indigenous people in Bolivia call it Dorea. It's a bird that looks just like an emu. And the, the uh, Incas in Peru called that a llama. So you've seen the llamas before? They saw that as a llama in the sky. Very similar traditions around the world. Question here? Good catch. Almost. Yes, there are. So the question was, if there are emu constellations, are there kangaroo or platypus constellations? Almost every animal you can think of had a stellar counterpart. It's certainly a lot of the birds did. The little, little thorny devil lizards you see, they had. Now sometimes they weren't to connect the dots constellation, it was just a star. But usually the color of the star represented something. So if it was a red star, it might be the red kangaroo, or it might be the um, black cockatoos with the red feathers. So like the star Antares was linked to that cockatoo. Um, if it was a blue star, it might relate to an animal that had bluish colors. So those links were there as well. Okay, you next and then we'll go to you. Ready? There are many different constellations in the sky, as you can imagine. Now, official Western astronomy, so we think of astrophysics, astronomy like you learn in school, there are 88. The smallest, remember, is the Southern Cross, and the biggest is Hydra, the water snake. But every culture in the world has their own constellations. So thousands and thousands of cultures, and those constellations sometimes change over time. So you go back tens of thousands of years, of tens of thousands of cultures, you get a lot of different constellations. So where was the one over here? Yep. Good job. I'm sorry? Which thing? The, the Gus's Bluff in Nerala? I've actually been there. Now I'll tell you something. If you haven't been to the Central Desert, it is an amazing, almost magical experience. I would, so you see the, the desert landscape's pretty flat, and you see this thing sort of jetting up out of the ground. It looks like a pancake that somebody set on the ground. When you go up close to it, really high, beautiful cliffs all around. And we got to go there with some geologists, and they're looking at all the, you know, the evidence that there was a meteorite crater. And I was just taken aback by how beautiful it was. You can stand there, you can look around and see it. It's an amazing sight. So if anybody gets the opportunity, go check it out. It's beautiful. There was one uh, a bunch. I've got a few. I've got plenty of balls left. <laughs> um, with the, the stories, the original stories, do they keep um, the chronological like, dating system as well to give you a time from when the story started? Um, with, with indigenous story, okay, let, let's, let's back up real fast. So when it comes to oral traditions, you know, a lot of times, I know you guys don't, but a lot of people tend to relegate oral traditions to myth and legend, they're stories. These aren't just stories. These traditions, whether they're song, dance, story, whatever, they contain all of the information that the entire community needs to survive. So it's not just the social laws, but it's also all the information about changing of seasons and you know, food economics and navigation. So the stories, um, most Aboriginal cultures didn't have linear time, it's more circular. So the seasons come and they go every year. The stars rise and they set. Sometimes it's short, like a day, the sun goes through in a day, the moon goes through its phases in a month, you know, and the position of the sun setting on the horizon changes throughout the year at the different seasons. So you didn't really have a chronological order in the way that we think of linear time. But you can use special astronomical events like an eclipse or a comet or the meteorite crater to figure out at least how old some of these traditions can be. And we have found some evidence and even as a scientist sometimes it's hard to believe, you know, but some of these traditions seem to have been handed down for over 12,000 years. And then you said that four and a half thousand years that devils uh, moved to shout up from the sun. Was the Nala one with the baby falling out of the sky, was that before 
or after like, they seen such a big media share? Or was there another one that they started that story? We don't know. I mean, that was one of the questions. You know, did, did people see this impact and then say, oh, well, that one formed kind of the same way? I mean, we, we don't know. We don't know. But we do know that knowledge systems were incredibly complex and very, very deep. In the red, got a red ball, ready? Yeah, sure, I'll try it. I haven't been very good at throwing today. Good catch. What does the Union Jack and the Australian flag mean? Ooh, um, as an American, we had a war, so we wouldn't have that on our flag. <laughs> Um, it, it refers to, a, it's a Commonwealth of Britain. So that's the Britain, British flag, which has the English flag, the Irish flag, well, the old Irish cross, and the Scottish flag all together. That's what it means. Other questions in the center right here? Sorry, I've got more. I'm sorry? Do the who have a story? The Olgas. The Olgas, yes. I don't know what it is. I have a memory. Hundreds of Aboriginal groups with hundreds of stories each that go back thousands. I, I, there's no way I can touch all of them. You know, I just, what I wanted to do tonight is share a bit with you of what I have learned over the last six or seven years. I'm, I'm an American. I mean, <laughs> how, how can I claim to be an expert on Aboriginal culture? It's just something that I've been learning about for, for a few years, and I wanted to share with you some of what I know. We work with elders. We have indigenous students coming in and they're going to be taking the lead of this stuff in a few years. So I just wanted to give you an idea of some of the stuff that I've learned in the last six or seven years that I've been here. But I'm by no means this enormous encyclopedia of knowledge on indigenous astronomy. Good catch. What if the sun gets too close to the Earth? It's not going to happen. Not for about four and a half billion years. About five billion years, that's going to happen, and we're all going to be toast. But until then, we're okay. Yep. Um, what has been your favorite Aboriginal story out of all the ones? Of all the ones, my favorite Aboriginal story is the story of, as I mentioned before, Norla. That's my favorite. That's because it has stuff in the sky, has stuff in the ground, it links together. It's a beautiful story. That's my favorite one. Maybe one day I'll find a different one that I like more, but so far that's been my favorite one. And I've been there, and it's really awesome. In the back, in the red, coming down. Nope, you, ready? Oh, good shot. What's the weirdest Aboriginal story? I don't know that I would say I've, had any, I've seen any weird ones, but I've certainly seen some that I really found fascinating. So for example, far western Victoria, out towards Portland, Port Ferry, the Gunjit Mara have these traditions that tell of this giant wave that came into the land, drowned everybody, killed everybody, and then it described mountains on fire. And it says when Mount Gambier burns again, that means this, the big wave is going to return. That's pretty fascinating because there were volcanoes in that area that erupted a few thousand years ago and before that. Mount Gambier is a remnant of a volcanic eruption. And we know that that part of the country, that part of the sea, is prone to tsunamis. So what we've been doing is like a colleague of mine at UNSW, James Goff, is a tsunami expert. He's also a really great guy. So he and I got permission from the Gunjamar elders to go out and do a little bit of investigating. So they, they, they supplied uh, with one of their trucks and an Aboriginal ranger guided us and we went to a few places where we would expect to find evidence of a tsunami if there was one. We did something called augering, means we take these drills that are about a couple inch, you know, a few centimeters wide and we dug some cores. And when we pulled them up, we found about a meter and a half or two meters down, a layer of ocean sediment. That's consistent with the tsunami, and about a meter and a half, two meters, is consistent with a few thousand years of soil building up. So we get very excited. So what we're going to do now is hopefully ask the government for a whole lot of money, which probably isn't going to happen, to go out there 
and do a full, huge investigation. We check and see, you know, look at volcanic eruptions, look at tsunamis, and correlate those, see how they relate to the Gunjit Mara oral traditions. So that's, that's some really amazing stuff that we're very excited about now. One more question, and uh, two more. You guys, you've already got a ball in your hand. That's all right. Okay, go ahead. Volcanoes. Yeah, question? Do you want to catch it? Can she get it? Watch. <laughs> Do you have a question? No, she just want to go. Okay, fair enough. I've got four more left. Four more questions. Might as well get rid of them now, quickly. Yep. So the question was, did indigenous people, were they aware of planets and place significance? Yes. They had separate names for planets because they recognized they moved differently from the stars. They had all kinds of traditions about planets, you know, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, all the ones that we can see. And some of them about Venus, there's a ceremony called Banambir, the morning star ceremony. So the morning star is Venus, the evening star is Venus, just because it's close to the sun. So we always see it in the evenings or in the uh, mornings. <coughs> Uh, very complex traditions where they, some places like in Arnhem Land, the Aboriginal people seem to have mapped out the relative motions of Venus, which there are five different patterns it repeats every eight years. Very long, detailed records mentally you'd have to keep to be able to figure that stuff out, and they seem to have done that. So it's quite detailed, these ceremonies. And yes, there are stories about Mars and, and being similar relating to blood and warfare like the Roman god Mars. Um, so yes, there's, there's a, some projects that we're hoping to do. So we're just scraping the tip of the iceberg on indigenous astronomy. And we're actively recruiting students, whether they're undergraduate students, high school students, or even some that want to do PhDs, to come work with us to help unlock some of these secrets. So what I talked to you about tonight, some of the Rundry stuff, was actually collected and analyzed by a student in my course on indigenous astronomy that I teach at UNSW. So she did an excellent job on that. Sorry. Um, sorry, did this story have any connection to the Pelagians? It sounds like there's some um, similarities there with, um, I think the Pelagians story had um, a group of sisters that were all... Yes. So the Pleiades, the little star cluster, sometimes called the Seven Sisters, um, very famous. Almost every culture in the world has a story about that. Because it's near the ecliptic, both people in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere can easily see it. Um, and what's really peculiar about it is it's usually around the world seen as a group of six or seven women, usually sisters, and Orion is usually a man or a group of men, many times hunters, chasing the Pleiades. And one of the reasons for that is because the stars move like this in the sky. The Pleiades are here and Orion's chasing the women around the sky. And sometimes the other, the sisters are protecting one of the younger sisters, one of the fainter stars, usually the seventh one, uh, from Orion the Hunter. You find stories like that all around the world from cultures that are separated by thousands of kilometers and thousands of years of history. Why? We have no idea. We can guess, but we really don't know. But it's really amazing you had so many stories that are so similar. Two balls left. Um, do you know Will Pina Pound? Do I know Will Pina Pound? Yeah. What about it? I can guarantee you every bit of land, every landscape, every animal, every plant, every star in the sky had an indigenous story about it. I don't know them, but they're there. Okay, uh, we've had a lot of hands going up and now I'll get a couple more quick questions. That was the worst throw ever. Yep. Can you wish upon a star? Oh yeah, you can wish upon a star. I do it all the time. Well. If whatever you're wishing for, you work for. You know, if I wish for a sandwich, I'll get that. If I wish to win the lottery, it's probably not going to happen. Uh, what's the average find? Was there any significance I found with eclipses? Uh, yeah, so uh, I'll take this as the last question because we'll be here all night if I, I, I'll keep going forever. So yes, is there special significance to eclipses? Um, there are solar eclipses, 
where the moon blots out the sun, and there are lunar eclipses where the moon goes into the Earth's shadow? And the answer is yes. And what some people find surprising is the commonality of stories about solar eclipses despite the fact that from any one place on the Earth, you only see one every few hundred years, which means they're significant and they've been recorded in old traditions, they've been handed down for hundreds of years. So they're different stories, but many of them relate to the superposition of the moon and the sun. Now, in most agricultures, the moon is male and the sun is female, and a total solar eclipse happens when they're hugging, hugging. So that means people worked out exactly the position of the moon and the sun and what happens during those eclipses. And there are lots of stories about the lunar eclipse. When it goes into totality, it turns blood red because all the light from the sun gets refracted through the atmosphere. All the blue and green light gets scattered, which is why the sky is blue. The red light goes through and makes the moon blood red. And a lot of the aboriginal stories talk about the total lunar eclipse relating to blood and death and things like that because of that color. Okay, that's the last question I have for now. If anybody has any more, I'm happy to, to answer them. But I think we want to get out for the telescopes and stuff. All right? Thank you very much, Dr. Hamaka, for that very interesting talk. That concludes the presentations for this evening, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. And of course, again, a huge thank you to the Mount Bennett Observatory team. As I said, it is a group of volunteers, uh, and they put this night together. So I think one more round of applause for them. And what about our MC? She deserves a round of applause too, right? Yeah.